Okay. Uh, so welcome. I'm glad you're with us uh, in the uh, chat. Once again, I've share, shared the uh, curriculum. We are now um, in Roman numeral four, um, letter I, okay? We've gone through the, um, we've gone through the kosher species of animals and fish and birds in the Torah. We've gone through the parts of animals that are kosher and non-kosher in the Torah. We've gone through the rabbinic, uh, major rabbinic innovation and, and, and expansion of these rules with this concept of tam kikar, that the taste of something is um, like the thing itself. Uh, we care about the taste of thing like the thing itself, which means that we're also going to be concerned um, um, we're also be concerned about about the like the the taste as it's absorbed into um, uh, pots and pans and utensils, right? Not just the thing itself, right? So that's that's an expansion and uh, ends up making it you know sort of uh, you know much more strict and much more complicated uh, than what uh, you you would just you know assume from from reading the Torah itself. Uh, so that's a big deal. Um, last time we also spoke about. Um, how that taste is absorbed, the things have to be piping hot for taste to be absorbed, or it's, and so things that are cold uh, won't tran taste won't transfer if they're cold. Without there's some medium for the you know if two uh, kosher pot non kosher pot are touching each other, even for years and years they won't taste won't transfer because it's cold, um, and you have some sort of uh, and further even if it's hot actually it wouldn't if they're if they're clean. Uh, you wouldn't have the taste inside one pot leave the pot and get absorbed into the other pot without some medium to transfer the taste some sort of so if you have uh, greasy pots or food in pots and they're touching each other then the taste transfers from the pot to the food to the next pot or from the pot to the grease to the next pot but if there are two clean pots they're touching each other even at high heat uh, high temperatures they won't have the absorbed taste transfer into the other object i'm not sure i actually mentioned that last time that's an important rule um that's a bit important to remember that okay so um and, but we also talked about how if the if the heat is not hot enough that your hand recoils when touching that's not hot enough for taste to transfer so you make a mistake when you're washing dishes and if you're washing dishes by hand your hands are there in the hot water by definition that's not too hot to prevent the the absorption of um the, the absorption of taste um okay um um, sorry, lost a train of thought. Um, and we, okay, we talked about not eating fish and meat together, which is a custom, even though there's no source in the Torah. Uh, Thomas says it's dangerous, so we don't do it. Uh, we talked about how you kosher, how you make something kosher if they become contaminated with non kosher taste, or if dairy and meat have been absorbed in the same pot or pan or fork or something, right? You you purge the, the non-kosher taste in the same way that the item absorbed the non-kosher taste. So you often immerse in boiling water. If it's something that touched the heat, the food itself under high temperatures, like a skewer, um, then you would have to kosher it through uh, like using a blowtorch or something or getting it glowing hot. Okay, so we did all that last time. Uh, hopefully that's familiar to those of you who were, joined us or who watched the video. So now I want to just talk about some areas of special concern areas of some special sensitivity, okay? So um, we have sink, microwave, dishwasher. So a sink, um, you have hot dairy and hot meat in the sink at the same time. Not because, not from washing dishes. Well, oh, sorry, one, one other thing, very, very important. We talked about, sorry. We had also talked about uh, last time about no tin time yam, that when tastes are more than 24 hours old, they become rancid and so uh, the rancid tastes don't um, uh, can't be a mechanism by which um, um, you know, the, the, the tanki car, the taste of the thing is like the thing itself, doesn't apply to rancid taste. Okay, and so if you um, let's, let's see a second. Um, right. Uh, Welcome back, Stacey. Uh, hopefully this works better. So if you have a, a an old taste, right, that's been that that was more than 24 hours absorbed into a pot, then if it comes out into something else, it's not going to um, make it non-kosher. Okay, so this is very, very important because it means that if you have accidentally used your meat pot to cook something, right, after 24 hours, the meat taste in the pot 
is a rancid and old meat taste and it won't render the thing that you cook there. It won't give it a meat status, won't, won't make it, you know, won't, won't, the dairy item cooked in a meat pot won't be non-kosher if the meat pot was used within, you know, more than 24 hours ago. So that, that's a huge uh, leniency. Um, so let's talk about your, your, uh, your sink though. What's going on in your sink? So in sink, you could have real problems because you can have actual hot dairy and actual hot meat both being poured into the sink at the same time. Washing the dishes won't be a problem because the water, if you're washing by hand, the water is not so hot, not hot enough that your hand can't be in it. And so taste won't be transferred that way. Um, maybe the things are all in the sink together, uh, which is the, like the foods are really touching the dairy and the meat or kosher non kosher really touching the thing together. Um, so even if it's not at high temperatures, they're actually, well, if, if they're soaking for a long time, that could be a problem or, um, or maybe it is really a high temperatures. It's you have your, you know, your, Boiler is so hot that it's too hot to actually touch with your hands and you're sort of putting the dishes in the sink, but not touching them. You're wearing gloves to do the dishes. You could you have your water temperature set very, very high. Um, so still would like, less like, not likely to be a problem with the dishes because you're using soap. And soap is has a, a rancid um, taste and the um, a negative taste, a bitter taste, a very, very foul taste. And so the mixture of dishes in your sink are going to be like mixed in with uh, um, the taste of soap. And so whatever taste is going to be transferred is going to be a negative taste is not going to um, render something, something non-kosher. So you don't have to worry about that in your dish, in your sink. But what could happen is you could have, let's say, a dairy soup or sort of mac and cheese that, or something very, very piping hot that you pour down your sink, um, maybe to empty your but, but you know, a, a pot or something, or just you're scraping, then your garbage disposals, so you're gonna have piping hot dairy touching the walls of your sink. And then within 24 hours, you could be preparing a different meal and piping hot, maybe you're making chicken soup and you're draining it out or something and piping hot meat falls in the sink. So the sink has absorbed meat and dairy together, or those tastes are absorbed together in the walls of the sink, that's not kosher. And so if you had something else piping hot in the sink, uh, soaking there um, or maybe in contact with the walls of the sink while they're wet or something, you could have non-kosher taste uh, come from the sink into your the plate or whatever it is that, that's in the sink. So that could be a problem. So the way we resolve that, I mean, some fancy people have two, two, uh, two sinks. That'd be great if you could do that. Um, my wife and I spent some time in Texas and uh, everyone there has two kitchens not just two sinks, like two entire double kitchens and they're really large Texas houses. Uh, that's less uh, easy to do in, in Chicago or most, most other cities. Uh, what you can do though, is put a grate inside your sink, a grate for meat and a sink liner, a grate for dairy. And then you're never gonna have your kosher dairy or meat plates or pots or stuff directly resting on the walls of the sink. So the walls of the sink, sinks used for everything, dairy and meat, the walls of the sink absorb everything, but your plates never touch it. You have a sink liner that you put your dairy plates on and they rest like half an inch above the sink and you have a sink liner for your meat, rest half an inch above the walls of the sink. And so your sink is never, your items in the sink are never touching the walls of the sink directly. And the therefore whatever gets absorbed into the walls of the sink is not gonna expunge its taste in a way that could contaminate um, some kosher utensil that is in the sink because it's not touching the sink directly. And if it's soaking in water, there's soap as well. And it's probably not gonna be hot enough for the taste to be transferred to, uh, from the sink walls to the, to the items as well. So that, that's how we deal with sinks, okay? We use sink liners. Uh, if you're lucky enough to have two sinks, that's great, but sink liners usually work. Questions, comments on sinks? Okay. Next, let's let's talk about um, dishwashers. I tried washers. to put, I'm sorry, I tried to put it in. Um, should really be very, very lenient because there's soap. And so even though there's very hot water, the water is sloshing around with soap. And so whatever taste is, there's meat, there's dairy, there's kosher, non-kosher, it's all mixed in with soap. And so the, as long as there's not actual chunks of non-kosher food, you know, hurtling through the dishwasher, sticking onto items there, uh, the fact that kosher, non-kosher, dairy and meat are in the dishwasher at the same time, merely kind of being sloshed around by the water, it's not gonna be a problem because there's soap in there as well. And so it's a rancid negative taste that's like in the dishwasher altogether and touching your plates and your utensils. So. And in fact, before dishwasher invented, the Shulchan Aruch discusses washing dairy and meat together in a giant vat of soapy water and says it's fine um, for this reason. But we're a little more careful and we're a little more strict. And we maybe are worried not about the taste itself, but the food item itself, like a, a block of food could be pressed against the opposite gender dish 
Uh, in the dishwasher, and that would be more of a problem. So we use dishes for dairy or for meat, generally not for both um, for this reason. But if you accidentally have the you open your dishwasher, you discover, oh no, I put a meat or a dairy spoon in my dishwasher, and we lose men for the other gender. So that, that's actually going to be, uh, that, that's going to be fine as well, because um, 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 the soap, the soap, because the soap there is, is going to render over the taste rancid. I actually always often sprinkle a little extra soap in the dishwasher so that when I, um, um, when I, um, as soon as the dishwasher is running, it, there's soap mixed in there, and so it's not a problem. Stacy asks, any consideration for vegans? I occasion, I'm, an, I'm an occasional, I have an occasional meat eating adult child visiting, right? So generally you have no meat, anything in your home, but you're, when your child comes, he wants to eat meat. And so you'd rather wash the dishwasher without, yeah. So, well, I guess if you're, I don't know. I mean, you're not, I would say pick, pick a side, right? You can make your dishwasher for par of things, for neutral things and for meat things. And then so, they never serve dairy in your home. And that would be one way to treat like, you know, you know, treat your kitchen, right? But um, I, I wouldn't um, relax the standards around how we treat dishwashers just because occasionally you have some, what you could do is you could switch over the dishwasher. You normally use a dishwasher, you could, you could you serve a big meat meal to your son's friends or something, and you know, which is unusual for you. So you could use the dishwasher for meat. And then after one leaves, you could cost your dishwasher and make it neutral again, right? Make sure the filter is empty, make sure there's no real food there. Uh, wait 24 hours so that any food that's in there is rancid, right? And then run it once with soap on the hottest, highest temperature. Whatever taste is absorbed comes out into the dishwasher when you run the cycle, gets mixed with the soap, so it's a bad taste, then it's gone, right? The way it comes in, that's what goes out. So you can just cash the dishwasher after your son's visit and use it for meat things while he's there and then go back. But if you're a vegan, it doesn't really matter. It's okay if it's meat because you're not eating dairy. So it really, does, it really wouldn't matter, right? There's no, there's no risk in... Uh, in, in using meat items, if everything else in your kitchen is, is part of a neutral, right? We only want to avoid meat and dairy mixing, but, you know, so there's the other, one, yeah, so there should be no, that's another way to do it, just, just treat everything as meat, because right? as a vegan, you don't eat dairy either, so there's really little loss in, in having all your dishes be, you know, meat possible. Um, okay. Other questions, comments? Okay. Next. Uh, guests and housekeepers. Yeah, so guests and housekeepers have to learn to the rules of your house, okay? That's just about, so I'd say it's a two-way street. Guests, I mean, let, that's, you know, housekeepers, you should be so lucky. Um, you know, uh, um, to have, you know, to hire somebody to do some household chores in your kitchen. Uh, but if you don't, maybe you have some guests, a parent, a friend, a sibling who's visiting, um, someone who isn't, you know, if you're, so okay, if a Jew who observes kosher, someone who keeps kosher visits someone else's home who keeps kosher, so you know to ask, like, which sponge should I use to wash this? You're bringing, you know, you're clearing your table at someone's home for a Shabbos, so where can I put this down, right? You know, you, you know to ask, you can't just like walk through someone else's kitchen and like haphazardly grab forks from drawers and put things down and scrape things. And, you know, you know, you know to ask because the kosher kitchen, you know, there's certain places you put things down, certain places you don't, certain places you can grab a fork and certain places you can't. Okay, so that's, but, but if you have a guest who isn't Jewish or isn't, doesn't know these rules, and it's your job as a host to explain them. Uh, and uh, and it's the you know, responsibility of the guest to respect the rules of the house. And, uh, and I think consider people do that. It's really not that, you know, it's not that hard. You don't have to give them all the nitty gritty and all the back and forth and the principles behind the rules. You just tell them, you know, uh, take these dishes from this cupboard when you're making breakfast if I'm not around. And, you know, when you're done, put them in the dishwasher or put them in the sink with that sink liner and we'll do the dishes later. I just whatever instructions you give, make keep them simple and, and consider people should be able to follow them in terms of housekeepers or babysitters or people you hire. So even the more so, you're paying them. They should listen to what you say and pay attention. And our experience with many, many housekeepers and nannies and babysitters over the years, and uh, they almost all really get it really quickly. Um, you know, I guess they're smart people, right? They're uh, doing your, uh, you know, um, yeah, they're watching your kids, you know, right? So, so like they can, if you trust them with your kids, you can trust them with your kitchen, okay? To, to follow instructions and learn how to, but, but it's your responsibility to tell them, right? And I think it's, uh, you know, they don't have to keep kosher. They can bring in their own food if they want, but just like they're in their kitchen, they're preparing food for your kid in your kitchen or they're um, cleaning up after you in your kitchen. So they should, you know, they should tell them enough to like, you know, where, where, where this types, you know, this, these dishes here in this cabinet, these are meat and these dishes here are dairy. And we, and we use these dishes and we wash them in different ways. Like it's just not that hard. And, 
a bit of a learning curve, but people get it. In our experience, people really, you know, uh, take their job seriously and are conscientious about observing these rules. And again, we try to keep it simple. If someone's not a nanny, not a, you know, like a babysitter, like a one-off babysitter, we're not gonna give her a tour of her whole kitchen or him a tour of her whole kitchen. We're just gonna say, snacks from these cupboards, use a paper plate, throw it out when you're done, you know, like whatever it might be to keep it simple. Uh, if, it, if it's not a, uh, a major long-term uh, customer, it makes sense to invest in explaining them precisely how it all works. Any questions on this? Okay, so I'll talk about um, um, uh, the next topic. Next topic is um, winging dairy meat. So, so the, the Talmud sa says that, um, quotes uh, one of the sages who said, my I am nothing compared to my father who is much more pious than I am. When he ate meat, he would wait um, an entire day before he ate dairy and I only wait from one meal to the next. Okay, that's the source, right? The Torah doesn't say you have to wait. Um, unclear, it doesn't seem to be like a mitzvah to wait per se, like an obligation, but but a uh, Talmudic sage says, um, here's what I do and here's what my father did. And so we take that seriously. So he says, I uh, too, um, sorry, I just lost my shot. Um, um, uh, I, he, the father waited from day to day, I would meal to meal. So what does meal to meal mean? Okay, there are two possibilities what meal to meal means. Just wanna say what you think it could, I mean, maybe you know, so don't, don't cheat, but what could meal to meal mean? I mean, yourself, please offer a suggestion. No wrong answers, except, I mean, if you know, don't say, but if you don't know, what, what, what might, what, someone says meal to meal, what would what that mean, Sarah? Anyone else? Meal to meal could mean the amount of time between typical meals, okay? Six hours, okay? Three meals a day, six hours between each meal. So when he says, I wait meal to meal, that means you wait six hours, okay? This became the Sephardic practice. Rambam endorses this, the Sephardic post can endorse this. And this is what Sephardic Jewry did, six hours. Because the Talmud says, you know, my father waited day to day, I wait only meal to meal. So that's what we do, meal to meal, meal to meal is six hours. The other option is what does it mean meal to meal? As I say, grace after meals, and I wash my hands, I'm done, the meal's over. I clear the table. Meal's over, I can go eat dairy now. And that was the position of the Tosigo. That's the Ashkenazi position. That was the Northern European position. Meal to meal means the meal's over. I say grace after meals, if my mouth is dirty, I wash it out, and then I can eat dairy. Some communities adopted a compromise of three hours or, or maybe one hour, but really it's like you don't wait. Really the essential positions that come from the Talmud that are, you know, logical explanations of what it means to wait meal to meal. Either it means six hours or it means no waiting at all. Just finish the meal, say grace after meals, wash out your mouth, you have something in your, in your mouth, and then you can do anything. Good. So uh, very, I don't think anyone does that anymore, but um, three hours maybe is like a compromise that emerged in Germany. There are uh, people in the Netherlands wait 45 minutes, okay? But essentially anything less than six hours is basically saying meal to meal means don't eat it at the same time. Make sure the meal's over. Once the meal's over, you can, uh, you can go ahead and... Uh, and have dairy. From dairy to meat, we don't have to wait. Maybe people wait through 30 minutes, um, but meat, you know, dairy doesn't stay as long in your system, doesn't take as long to digest, it gets caught in your teeth. And so we don't wait from dairy to meat, we just wait from meat to dairy, um, except for hard cheese. Hard cheese has been aged more than six months. We also wait, however long you wait from meat to dairy, you wait as well from dairy to meat if the dairy in question is, um, is hard aged cheese. It used to be very, very rare to find kosher, and now with the Cheese Guys brand of kosher cheese, it's actually not that hard to find. So if you eat those cheeses, um, you should you should wait. Um, you should wait. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought while I was speaking. I hope I, I still missed something. Everyone understand? Any questions or comments on what I just said? Okay. Um, all right, let's see if we can finish this. Um, Section K, tithing other mitzvot connected to Israeli produce. Okay, so in the Torah, the Torah says that that in land of Israel, you have to tithe, you have to separate uh, certain parts of your produce and give it to the Kohen, and certain parts go to the Levi, and certain parts you don't eat in certain places at certain times. All these rules about agriculture in Israel, this is generally handled now at the wholesale level. So the companies that buy the produce from the farmers and prepare it for sale, those wholesalers, they separate all the tithes that have to tithes that have to be separated. They make sure that everything. Uh, is uh, you know happens as it should and is done well, uh, and um, 
that's easy. But if you have, you know, your, your cousin on the kibbutz gives you some grapes that he grew himself. So grapes that grow in the land of Israel, you have to separate tithes where you can eat them. A good Israeli seedra will tell you how to separate the trumot and maestro, the tithes to this goes to the Kohen and this goes to the Levi and this you discard and you wait and you, whatever you do with it, right? So a good seedra will tell you what to do. In America, this is almost never relevant. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. If you're in Israel, you can also not worry about it if you just buy your fruits and vegetables at a supermarket, which has a hexer. Okay, in Israel, the produce section has of the supermarket has a cash fruit certification symbol because you want to make sure that all the produce had this process of tithing done. Um, um, so that that so so like it's not not so it's not super relevant at the moment, but um, and not super relevant for a moment. But but it, it, if you're in Israel, it is it is relevant. You have to pay attention and not just assume that fruits and vegetables are automatically kosher because they're really not. Uh, other issues with kashrut uh, of food that you'd have to be concerned about. We have uh, um, L, um, insects, right? Insects are not kosher, so you can't eat insects. So certain types of produce can be tends to be infested with insects. You should be careful not to eat produce infested with insects. I, I cut them up into pieces. I soak them in water with a little vinegar. I rinse vigorously, make sure the water is clean. No little flies, okay? That, that's for, for like sensitive vegetables like broccoli and stuff like that. Or lettuce, which is very commonly infested with small insects, okay? We say things that don't, don't cause kashi problems less than 1 60th its volume, but an intact insect uh, is not nullified. It's, a, it's an exception to that rule. And so we're concerned with, with intact insects that might be uh, infiltrating our produce. That's another thing that you, know, you can't just assume that fruits and vegetables are automatically kosher. They should be cleaned and we should look and make sure there's no, there are no insects on them. Uh, okay. Um, Kilayim, the Torah prohibits mixing species together, um, grafting, things like that. Um, but uh, there seems to be okay to eat the produce of Kilayim, so not so relevant. You can't plant, you know, different types of food crops in close proximity to each other to space them out a little bit. That's also, if you have a garden and you're farming, you should learn about that, otherwise it's not too relevant. Uh, challah, we also tithe dough. The Torah says you separate a portion of your dough when you make bread, you give it to the Kohen. We don't give it to the Kohen anymore because the Kohenim are, are impure, they're not, they don't have their status. So we separate a piece of dough every time we bake bread and we and we burn it. If you bake a lot of bread, high volume, you separate, you, you do the mitzvah in the fullest way, you say a bracha as you separate the dough. If you're making a smaller quantity of um, of, of dough, you would not you would separate without a bracha and the dough gets that you separate gets burned since there's no Kohen with an intact um, status and lineage that we can give the dough to. Um, my, my, my wife's challah recipe, she makes the regular recipe, it's below the threshold, she doesn't separate challah with a bracha, and it's above the, um, it's above the threshold. She, she makes a double recipe, it is above the threshold, she separates with a bracha, okay? But separate anyway, uh, just don't say a bracha unless, it, I, and you can look up, uh, how much flour do you need in order to say to separate challah with a bracha and, and whether you do ever do baking in that quantity. Uh, Shemitah is sabbatically. Every seven years, there are special rules about act governing agriculture land of Israel. This is one of those years. In America, it really does not something you have to worry about. The produce, again, is going to be fine. In Israel, during the Shemitah year, again, you have to make sure you're buying produce from a grocery store that has cash with certification because there's a lot that could be wrong. It could be or uh, right, so there some produce, most of the produce, they sell the farm to a Gentile for the Shemitah year and they buy back from after the year. And so the farm doesn't actually belong to Jews. And so they continue to work the land and and and, uh, and harvest its produce. Uh, others, uh, the farmers don't harvest the food and the bait in the court somehow hires workers to harvest the food and they sell it without profit. And in that way, um, people can get food and you know the country can endure during the Shemitah year. Others, this rely on entirely imported fruits and vegetables during the Shemitah year. So you have to pay attention when you buy fruits and vegetables in Israel during the Shemitah year. If you go there now, up until, you know, um, you should, um, uh, yeah, you guys have something to, to like pay attention to. And uh, again, reasons to look for a kosher certification when even when you're buying fruits and vegetables. Okay. Um, next. To feel that Kalim. So this is interesting. This doesn't necessarily belong in the Kashrut section. Um, it's not really about kashri per se, but we immerse our metal utensils that are used for eating our clay suda in a mikvah uh, before we use them for this first time, if they've been made by a non-Jew. It's like uh, maybe because our kitchens and our cooking is such a Jewish um, sphere, right? We only eat food cooked in kosher kitchens. And so we want our, our pots and pans and things to also be Jewish too, as it were. And so if a Gentile makes them, we want to, in addition to make sure that they're kosher, like if they've been used, 
is certainly kosher, but you want to immerse them in the mikveh. It's like a conversion ceremony for pots and pans before they join a Jewish kitchen. Or kosher. Okay, so you go to the mikveh, same mikveh that's used for people, use it for pots and pans, many, I mean, the same requirements, the basic requirements. Um, many places will have like a smaller mikveh that's the minimal size. But you're going to be hard for a person to squeeze in there, but you could dunk your forks and knives and your plates and your glasses and things like that in, into the into that mikvah. So the shul has a kalim mikvah. It's a mikvah that is too small for, for, I mean, technically a person could fit in, but it's not what it's used for. It's used uh, for immersing items to that kalim only. Um, okay. Um, finally, what's a reliable heksher? So I've been using that phrase. So, there, so a heksher, right? It means a company and an agency has inspected the factory or the restaurant where the food is made and is certifying that it's kosher based on their observations of what they've seen. Um, and a uh, good one means you trust the operation. And their menu, you know, and, and they know what they're doing. They know the Jewish law as relevant and they know the food preparation industry, you know, well enough to actually um, supervise in, in like a, in a, um, you know, in, in a, Revise in a serious way. Um, a bad hacker can be bad for several reasons. It can be bad because they're honest people and reliable people, but they have maverick positions on relevant halachic questions, like how do you purify a air dryer or something like that that was used for non-kosher food, and now you're going to do a kosher run in the same factory line. Um, how do you kosher in between what's required, right? So there may be a majority opinion that the major kosher agencies have all coalesced around and embrace, and you have a maverick agency that doesn't embrace that standard, so that would be a non-reliable actually. You wouldn't might want to eat it because you're there's a different standards than, than what's become mainstream, what you're used to. Uh, another reason why it could be bad, it could be very you know honest, decent people, but they don't have the wherewithal to actually supervise the restaurants that they've signed up or the factories they've signed up because they're like one guy who's in the city and he's supervising restaurants across the country. How can he possibly be there? Uh, or the person's a little naive and doesn't understand how the caterer or the factory owner uh, could be running circles around him and bringing in ingredients that are not approved for use in the factory and the supervisor has absolutely no idea. It's like he's a decent person, but he's not competent to actually provide that sort of supervision. The third possibility is um, that the non-reliable hexer is both, is, it's like it's a maverick positions and unreliable, you know, people and like not trustworthy people, like they're, they're um, not, not fully honest or and, and and there are agencies that have unfortunately really negative reputations for issues about integrity and honesty and reliability not just about like difference of opinion and not just about competence and supervision but also about uh, those basic issues so the shul has a list other agencies have a list of reliable hexarim uh the, the best ones really are in constant communication with each other to consolidate standards um and so you use, use products with a good hexer any product that needs a hexer you should get a good one is where it's worth the finding a product that's a good hexer you know and it's um you know, marginal cost to the company. They make, you know, 10,000 items. So a fraction of a penny for um, supervision for these certain items, certain products, you know, is, is a worthy goal for them. So we can reinforce that by buying products with a good, good hexer. Okay, questions, comments on this? Okay. Let, let's pause here. We went very fast, but we covered a lot of ground. We'll pick up with Roman numeral five next time. I'm right, we're running out of weeks before Rosh Can we meet it one more? It's okay. We can meet the fifth is it that's Labor Day. Twelfth. Oh, twelfth. I'm at a wedding. I can't do the twelfth. The nineteenth is right before Rosh Hashanah. The twenty-sixth is Rosh Hashanah. The third is right day before everyone Kippur. That's not good. Third of October. Tenth of October is Sukkot. Seventh of Rosh Hashanah. It's the twenty-fourth of October. Will be the next class. It's a long time from now. Okay. We'll do, eight we'll do eight o'clock, okay? Um, on the 24th of October. So if you have questions or comments, we now in, at 24th in the month, next month, uh, please reach out, call or text, um, and uh, let me know how I can be helpful. And uh, you know, you won't be meeting as a class for a while, okay? So thank you so much for learning. I'm gonna actually stop recording now. Um,